Good morning. It's great that you want to have a look with me into the future of Angola. I have prepared a bunch of things for you. First of all, I want to show you what Ivy can do today for you. Ivy, the new compiler for Angular. And then we will look into a possible future that is possible because of Ivy. Things Ivy provides and also things Ivy will be the foundation for. Let me first of all introduce myself. I am Manfred. I'm a trainer and consultant for Angular. I'm helping a lot of companies nowadays with Angular. I'm providing trainings, workshops and development. And I'm also part of the Google Developer Expert team. Also, since the beginning of the year, I'm part of the Angular team. I'm an external member called a trusted collaborator. And my current product is also about Angular. It's a workshop for advanced topics you need when you are developing Angular in the enterprise. It's aimed at Angular enterprise architecture and enterprise applications. Okay, let's get started with the first of the two big topics. Let's get started with Ivy and what's possible with it today. As you know, Angular is compiling your HTML templates to JavaScript in order to make the JavaScript more performant. And Ivy is the new compiler for this. There have been a compiler doing this, and uh, now we have Ivy, which is trying to do this in a better way. And one of the nice things is that Ivy leads to up to 40% less bundle size. This is quite awesome, if you ask me. You have the same application, but the bundle size is up to 40% smaller, which, of course, reflects into a better startup performance and so on and so forth. What you see here is a statistic presented this year at NGConf, and the statistic shows several things. At the left side, you see bundle sizes for a Hello World application when using the so-called Vue engine. The Vue engine is the predecessor of Ivy. The first bar is using Vue engine only, and the second bar is about using Vue engine together with differential loading. Differential loading means that your browser gets an optimized bundle if the browser is supporting ECMAScript 2015, it gets an optimized ECMAScript 2015 bundle. If it is not supporting ECMAScript 2015, I think we all know about which browser I'm talking, then it gets an ECMAScript 5 bundle. And so, when going with ECMAScript 2015, we can spare some bytes. And so a Hello World application here has about 131 kilobytes, which is quite big, if you ask me, for a Hello World application. When we are using Ivy together with differential loading, we can uh, spare about uh, 20 kilobytes, which is a good start, but there is even more uh, into this. Namely, if you look at the last bar, the bar for thrill seekers, then you see the true potential of Ivy. When backwards compatibility is not a topic for you, if you are using nowadays the private APIs Ivy is providing, then you can shrink this Hello World application to 14K. And this is smaller than every single page application using some framework also very lightweight fl frameworks out there uh, are bigger than 14 Ks. So I think that really shows what the potential here is, even though we cannot use the potential immediately because we have to be backwards compatible, but in long term, this is where we can land. Perhaps you're wondering how, I how Ivy is capable of this, and to answer this, I want to start with a first demonstration. For this demonstration, I have brought a simple application and one component of this application is this hello, uh, no, this, this home component. And as you see here, this home component just has a property with the value welcome. And if you look into the template, this property is just written out. So nothing special happens in here. And now the big question is, what does Ivy do with the source code? And to provide an answer, I will look with you into the compiled bundle. 
let's look into our distribution folder and there we have bundles. I'm using differential loading, which means I have a bundle using ECMAScript 5 and another bundle using ECMAScript 2015. Of course, we are interested into the later one. If you look here, what you see first is that Ivy keeps your component as is. The class stays as is. It has a constructor with a property info which gets some value. And then in addition to that, Ivy is adding some metadata. For instance, Ivy is adding here a factory function. A factory function that creates this component. The factory function is just a static property, a static method of our home component. It is uh, prefixed with this data here. They are using the data to define that this property is part of the private API, so you should not directly use it. Something that's a bit more exciting is the metadata about the component itself, the metadata within the component property, data component. It is set up using define component and it points to everything Ivy needs at runtime to execute your component. For instance, it points to the components type, to the selectors, there are some properties for housekeeping and then we have here a template function. And this is quite awesome, because this template function is the compiled version of your HTML. Because it's compiled, because it's JavaScript, it is really, really quick. And when you look into it, you see that this template function just takes two parameters. The first parameter is RF, which stands for rendering phase. And there are just two possible rendering phases. The first rendering phase is the creating phase. In this phase, the template is built up. All the elements are written into the page. And then we have the update phase, where all the data bindings are updated. So if you look at the creation phase, you see a lot of elements are created. There is a diff element created, another diff, an h1 element, and we have a text placeholder with the ID free. The text placeholder is nothing less than a placeholder for this data binding here. And then we are of course closing all our tags. In the update phase, we are just jumping to the element with the ID free, which is the placeholder for our text, and then we are doing some interpolation. Then we are writing the value of info into this tag. So as you see here, Ivy and the result of Ivy is very close to traditional JavaScript. It looks like something you would very likely write by yourself if you wrote your own framework. Your own framework, your own library. It looks a bit like things we did 10 years before. And the best thing about this, because it is that close to the dome, because it's that close to JavaScript, it is very, very tree shakeable. Everything of Angular Core itself is tree shakeable. Just think we don't need a text placeholder, then this function is just thrown out of your bundle. If you don't need tags, which is very unlikely, then this function here is thrown out of the bundle. So at the end of the day, everything you don't need, especially everything that is part of Angular Core, can easily be thrown out. They are calling this tree shaking. And this shows why Angular can produce such small bundles. OK. So what do we need to get Ivy? The good message is, beginning with Angular 9, we get Ivy by default. We don't need to do anything, we get Ivy by default, saying this Angular 9 will soon be a release candidate, so it does not take a long time until it will land. If you run into edge cases where Ivy does not work with your project, you can easily opt out. Just switch this flag here in your tsconfig.json to false and you will use the good old view engine. The Angular team wants to encourage you to try out Ivy and if it does not work, please report your very edge case to the team. So what is the roadmap? 
as mentioned with Angular 9 in some weeks, we will get IB by default and the focus here is on backwards compatibility, which means they are trying really hard to make everything work that worked before. And then, beginning with Angular 10, hopefully, there will be new features based upon Ivy. Ivy has been designed with a lot of new features in mind, but uh, the plan is, first of all, it has to land, it has to be backwards compatible, and then the team will sit together and talk about what are the next steps, what can we do to leverage Ivy for new features. In most presentations you see out there, you will see that IAB produces small bundles. But there is a bit more other than small bundles. For instance, you can use lazy components. When you are using lazy components, then you can just import a component with an ECMAScript inline import. This is quite new. It has not been possible before. Before, with Vue Engine, you have only been capable of importing modules. Modules with several components in it, for instance, because the metadata of everything was part of the module. But now, as you have seen before, the whole metadata is part of the component itself, part of those properties we've seen. They are calling this locality. Locality means that everything is local to the component and so it's possible to directly import just one component using this uh, official syntax here, this ECMAScript syntax. This is neither an Angular specific thing, it's pure ECMAScript. After you've imported your module, you can grab the component out of this file and then you need nowadays a component factory to be backwards compatible. In the future, you can skip this very line here. In the future, you can directly work with the component. Nowadays, you will need this component factory. And then you just need a view container to instantiate the component in a dynamic way. And so a dynamically loaded component will appear dynamically on your page. So let me show you a simple example for this. In this example, I'm showing you my demonstration application. It is a dashboard. And when I'm clicking at dial, a dashboard dial is loaded with some random data and dynamically inserted into the page. To prove that lazy loading takes happen, I will reload everything. I will switch to my network tab. And here I will push a dial, and as you see, the component, only the component, is loaded on demand, which is quite nice. If we look into the source code for this, into my dashboard page component, we see I'm just using this ECMAScript import, I'm pointing to my component file, I'm getting back everything this file is exporting, and then I'm grabbing out the component of the file itself. Then I need this uh, uh, factory resolver, this component factory resolver, CFR, which I get hold of by means of dependency injection. If you look into the constructor, here is where it comes in. I'm using a view container where I'm creating the component and I'm just passing this factory. If you're wondering where this view container comes from, it comes from a placeholder element in my page, just a diff, a placeholder. I'm getting hold by means of a view child. Here the view child is querying the element with the VC uh, handle and I'm reading it as a view container reference. Then, of course, you are getting back an instance of your component and that means you can work with this component. You can assign properties A, B and C. Those are the three values you have seen on my dashboard, those three values. And then I'm saying, hey, now it's time to update everything. I'm directly triggering Angie on changes. So more or less li uh, really straightforward, other than things have been before. This was somehow possible before with modules, but it demanded a lot of technical code using internal APIs of Angular.
There's another thing IV allows you to do. It allows you to do debugging in a better way, debugging at runtime within your JavaScript console. And for this, I want to show you something my good old friend Yuri wrote about some weeks ago. Yuri told us in his blog article that there is an ng object uh, flying around in your JavaScript console and you can use it to query some components, directives, pipes and so on at runtime. Here I'm just taking the object $0, which is the object that has been currently marked within your source explorer. It is an element that has been selected by the means of your cursor. I am taking this element, I'm grabbing the component out of it, and then I'm messing around with the component. I can look into the properties, I can trigger methods, I can even trigger the change detection. Let's have a look at this. So when we went into our debugging tools, then I can select my dial, for instance. Here it is, the deck for the dial. And as I marked it, it gets the value uh, zero. And when I'm switching to the console, I'm seeing an error. Let's clear this error. That's my favorite way of getting rid of debugging errors. And when I'm looking into zero, I'm seeing this element here. And then I can use the ng uh, object to get the context of this element or to get a debug node, to get directives. I just want to get the component instance itself. And this is where I'm getting back my dashboard dial component. And so let's mess around a bit with it. Let's say A is my loan. And let's increase this loan. No. Of course, the value is changed, and what I also need to do is, in this component, I have to trigger ng on changes, and now I'm getting what I deserve, if you ask me. <laughs> nice. Okay. So this is everything Ivy can do for you today. But the thing is, the architecture of Ivy is really smart. And there is a lot of potential in there for future features. Features that will be Angular more flexible, more lightweight in the future. And so let's switch to the second topic of today. Let's look about the Ivy and its possibles of tomorrow. The important thing here is the question mark because I have to start with a word of caution. In the next slides, for the rest of this presentation, I will use private APIs. Private APIs to show the potential, to give you a glimpse of what's possible tomorrow. But as you know, it is not a good idea to use private APIs in production. Please prevent this. And there are no guarantees that those features will ever land in Angular. But the fact is, Ivy has been designed with all these ideas in the head, and so it is very likely that the Angular team will provide this Ivy in a public way. So let's get started with a simple one. Get, let's get started with bootstrapping. So nowadays, you have to bootstrap whole modules. This looks like this. I think you all know the source code. It is in your main DS, and it just kickstarts an app module. Instead of this, with Ivy, you can just render one component. You can just bootstrap one component, which is very lightweight and makes sense for small applications or for web components. Talking about web components, you can easily create your own Ivy-based web component. Just create a web component by hand, which means you have to subclass HTML element. And then within the constructor, you will normally write something into the web component, an h1 tag, a diff tag, an input. Instead of this, I'm just telling Ivy, Ivy, it's showtime. Please render this component into the middle of our web component. I'm calling render component. I'm passing my very own Angular component. And so this Ivy component will appear inside of the web component itself. 
Here I am already using this Frill Seeker API. That means we will have very small bundle sizes here. About 10k plus minus uh, will result here. Perhaps you are wondering what's with Angular Elements. Because normally we have Angular Elements to automate this. To automate the creation of a web component that calls an Angular component. And the thing is, yes, it would be possible, but currently Angular Elements is not using this private Frill Seekers API that allows you to get those very small bundle sizes. You will be somewhere where you have seen before, somewhere in the area of 100 Ks, which is kind of big for a web component. The alternative to this is to hand wrap your IV component as seen before on the last slide write a web component, call Ivy inside of it, or you can use this open source tool here. Uh, it's called NGX Elements. It is doing the same, but automatically. It automatically creates the web component and calls Ivy with the component inside. So let me show you a simple example for this. For this example, I'm switching over to my web component. Web component, where is it? Custom elements demonstration, yeah. Oh, I'm in the dist folder. That's why. Custom elements demonstration. And here we have our flight component, which is just a simple component. It takes a flight, it displays the flight, and we can select or unselect the flight. When we select or unselect it, we get a selected change event. The element itself is just a web component, as you see here, just a class extending HTML element. And when it comes to showtime, in the middle of the constructor, I'm just rendering my flight component using Ivy. I'm telling Ivy, render it directly into this, which is the web component. Of course, when I'm getting back the component, I have a handle to the components instance, which means I can set properties like my flight with uh, lots of properties or as you see here, I can set up an event handler for an output for select a change. When it comes to my event handler, then I'm just dispatching a DOM event so that it is conformed to web components, which is called select a change. And if someone is setting a property of this web component, you see it here, for instance, set flight. Then I'm passing this flight into the component and I'm telling the component, hey, it is time to update yourself. This is currently uh, needed when just bootstrapping an Angular component. We will talk about this more in detail a bit later. So at the end of the day, it is just a wrapper for a web component. And because it is just a wrapper for the web component, I can use it directly within the browser, like here. And I can mess around with it using the dome. Good old 20 year old dome magic, as you see here. I'm grabbing the element by ID, I'm setting the flight property, and I'm hooking up an event listener. So why do I'm using dome APIs here? I'm using DOM APIs here to prove that this web component is directly, uh, directly provided by the browser. It's a browser thing, a browser standard. And when I'm capable of using it with the DOM API, I'm capable of using it with all the frameworks out there. With AngularJS, with Angular, with VanillaJS. Are there other frameworks? I, I don't think so. I think that's, that's all. Something that's very cool here is also the bundle size. Let's have a look into the bundle sizes of this. Let's go in the distribution folder, custom elements demonstration. And here we have the main file for ECMAScript 2015. And as you see here, it just has 43 Ks. 
If we add the runtime support, we have 45 Ks. And if we gzip it, we are under 10 Ks. So this is really a size where it makes sense to go with web components. Under 10 Ks should be okay -ish for a lot of use cases. Okay, web components. Now let's proceed to the most difficult topic of today. This is really difficult. It's about dynamic components and higher order components. Who use concepts like this in other frameworks? Okay, some of you, I guess you are using React, is it true? Yeah, it is a concept. React people used in the past. Nowadays they have other uh, features there like hooks, but it was quite heavily used in the past there. The idea is quite simple. It is like every Hitchcock movie at the beginning, everything is simple and easy, and then it's getting tough. But at the beginning, it's really nice. You know, the new family moves into a new house and everything is cool. They love each other. We have a function. <laughs> <laughs> and this function can now create a class dynamically. This is our component, our dynamic component. And then everything we need to do is to add metadata to this component. Just to add metadata using the fine component with the template function, with the, uh, with, the, with the factory function for the component, and so on and so forth. And then you can just return this component and bootstrap it or put it into a few, few container, as shown before, with my dashboard tiles. So this is really all it takes to create a dynamic component. The idea here goes a bit further. The idea here is that we can also pass a so-called inner component. And then we could call this inner component within the template of our dynamic component. That means the dynamic component is just wrapping our past component. And this is what's called a higher order component, a component that calls another component. Let's also have a look into this. My dashboard displays a year. It is currently the year 2020, but by messing around with the matrix parameter year, I can switch back or forth to another year, for instance, to the year 2000. Shoot, and as you see here, we are getting the year 2000. The thing is that my dashboard page component does not know about routing at all. It can be used with or without routing because it does not know about the router and about routing parameters. Let's have a look into this component. When we look into the dashboard page component, we see everything it knows is that it can get a year. But it does not know where this year comes from. Perhaps from the router, perhaps from another component. We still don't know. In order to tell this component where the year comes from, we need the outer component, a component we are wrapping around this one. And if you hard coded this component, it would look like this one. You see a simple component, we are getting hold of the activated route by means of dependency injection. And here we are setting up our observable for the routing params. And after receiving the routing params, we are putting them into a variable, into a property. Within the template, I'm calling my dashboard page and I'm passing the year. The year gets the matrix parameter with the same name. So when you think about this use case and when you think about redoing this for 20 other components, you will find out that this component will look the same all the time. It will look the same, but just the name of this element will change and the name of the parameters will change. The rest will be the same. So this is really a nice candidate for creating a dynamic component that passes all the matrix parameters to inputs. And this is what I have done within my HOC file. I will not explain here line by line. You get the source code afterwards, but let's have a look at the ideas of it. 
We have this with route function. We are getting the inner component passed, our dashboard component, and then I'm looking into the metadata of the dashboard component. The thing I want to use is the selector of the dashboard component, which is, for instance, you know, dashboard component or dashboard page component. After this, I'm creating my dynamic component, my higher order component, which is just doing what we have seen before, getting hold of the activated route and reading all the params, putting the params into a property. Then I'm assigning my metadata, a factory function that is instantiating our component. And what you see here is also quite interesting. The IV compiler is also taking care about dependency injection. Here, IV already knows, hey, at runtime, we need an instance of the activated route. That means at runtime, nothing much needs to happen for dependency injection. Yeah, and here we have the other metadata, and the important thing here is the template function itself. In the creation phase, I'm just creating an element with the name of the inner component, for instance, with the name dashboard page component. This is what happens here. And in the update function, I'm just looping through all the received parameters, through all the routing parameters, I'm asking the component, hey, is there an input with the name of the routing parameter? For instance, is there an input here? And if there is an input, I'm just assigning this parameter to this property, to this input. I'm just assigning the year parameter, the year matrix parameter to the property year of the dynamic component here. It's a bit difficult, I know it uh, causes an ache in the brain, but I think you've seen the principle of this and, of course, you get the source code afterwards. You have to laughly look at it for 15 minutes and then you will say, hey, great, how could I even live without this? At the end, I'm returning this. Writing such a thing is difficult, but if you've wrote it, if you wrote it, using it is very simple. If you look into our app routes, we just need a route. It is pointing to our dashboard component, and when doing so, it is wrapped using with route. So you could you reuse this function with all your routed components out there. It is just one idea how you could make use of a higher order component. Let's proceed with something that's a bit more easy. Let's proceed with ng modules, or let's say with optional ng modules. The thing is, the Angular team does not like ng modules. And initially, they did not want to implement them. Because they said, hey, we have ECMAScript modules. Why not just go with the standard? But then, unfortunately, very late, I think it was release candidate 5, they realized that for technical reasons they need ng modules, and so we have it nowadays. But since then, they are discussing ways to get rid of them. By the way, I'm not allowed to say get rid of them. I'm only allowed to say to make them optional, because getting rid of them would be a breaking changes, and this is definitely not what they have in mind but they want to make it optional. And this is quite easy when you think about the metadata within your components, because this metadata within the component could point to all the other components we want to use. Let me show this with an example. Here I have a view component as, and a bar component, as this is such a nice habit, and I'm taking out the metadata of those components. And then I'm just assigning the metadata of the bar component to the directives uh, property, to the directives array of the view component. And so the view component knows, hey, there is a bar component, I can call it. This is how Ivy works. Ivy does not care about your Angular modules. The Ivy compiler, for reasons of compatibility, looks into your ng modules and creates this code here. That means at runtime only this code here is used. 
saying this, of course, this is a private API, but we can make use of it with public APIs if the Angular team decides for it. And this is something they have on their minds. What we could do is, if we wrote a library, a component library, we could just provide an array with all the components. This is what uh, is left behind from our modules. It is more or less the export section of our modules. This is everything we need. We are just grouping our components. And this is also not needed, but convenient to group components that belong together with an array. And then within the consumer, we could just import this array. And we can then assign this array to the directives array of our own components, of the components we want to use the other components within. This would work nowadays, but of course you have to deal around with private APIs. Minko from the Angular team wrote a proposal about, I think, three quarters ago. And he said, hey, let's introduce a dependencies array into our component decorator. And with this dependencies array, we can just point to the other components we want to use. So this is currently a proposal, and perhaps it will land in Angular. I've also written something like this. If you look into my example, you see that I have those dashboard titles with bars. Each bar is an own component, a so-called bar component. And if you look into the bar component, then you see it is really drop dev simple. It takes a value, 47, something like this, and it takes a color like blue, green, red, what you like. And both is displayed afterwards. I've also put this bar component into an array, which will get other bar components I'm writing when I have some time in 2025. And uh, when we look into our dashboard style module, we see that the bar component is not pointed to. I've commanded the bar component out to prove that this really works without using ng modules. Instead, in my dashboard tile component, I'm using a custom decorator. Don't try this at home, it is just for the sake of demonstration. A custom decorator that squeezes in those bar components into my dashboard tiles metadata, and so the dashboard tile can call directly the bar component without making use of ng modules. Very nice. At the end of the day, we just need traditional ECMAScript features, which is always a good thing. Always when you can exchange a framework-specific feature by an official ECMAScript feature, it is a win-win situation for all of us. Let's come to another topic. This is about zoneless change detection. Who knows about zone chairs? Ah, some of you. So zone.js is always magically involved in all your Angular applications. It is the key for automatic change detection. It's monkey patches, all the browser objects, which is uh, kind of special, if you ask me. When bootstrapping, it goes through all the browser objects, all the dome objects, all the promises, and so on and so forth, and monkey patches their events. And so, Zone.js can find out when an event handler runs. And after an event handler run, it tells Angular, hey, there was an event handler, please update your data bindings. Please make sure your data bindings are up to date. And Angular is saying, yes, I'm doing this, I'm checking my data bindings. This is why Angular finds out automatically when it needs to update something. There is also a downside of using this. First of all, Zone.js has over 100 Ks. And perhaps 100 Ks is not that bad, but if you think about web components, it's a no-go. No one will ship a 5K web component alongside a 100K Zone.js implementation. That does not work. 
no one will use this. This is one downside. Another downside is SonJS is kind of magic. It works until it works, and if it stops working, then you really have an issue. Then debugging this issue is really, really difficult. And, and this is a really big thing. SonJS cannot monkey batch native async await statements introduced with ECMAScript 2017. If we down-level our code, our async await syntax to ECMAScript 2015 or ECMAScript 2016, everything is fine. Because when down-leveling this, we are getting promises, and promises can be monkey batched. But if we are using native keywords like async await, SonJS cannot do much. Perhaps if you have some time, try to compile your Angular application with ECMAScript 2017. The CLI will immediately spit out a warning that something might break now. And so we need some alternatives to zone shares. And the good message here is IV has been designed without zone shares in mind. In IV we have this make dirty function. It is just a function that takes a component and when we call this function, Angular will dirty check the component and if something changed, the component will be updated. Let's have a look into this. In my example, I will carve out zone.js that's possible when bootstrapping the application since Angular 5, we can uh, define here an ng zone property, which could be an existing zone instance or the noob zone, the no operation zone, which is the Austrian amongst zones JS implementation. It is landing back and doing nothing. Really like it. So after we have this, we don't have zone.js in our application, and so some things will not work. All the things here relying upon automatic change detection. For instance, this title here is not displayed immediately, but this dashboard dial component works because here I'm calling mark check. Everything is updated, even without zone.js, because I'm calling this mark check property inside of here. Of course, always calling mark check by hand is everything but funny. What we want to have is to get automatic change detection back. And this is what the Angular team is discussing since several months. They are brainstorming several ideas for this for months. And I just want to show you two ideas two ideas that might come up in future versions. One idea is the push pipe. When using the push pipe, you will go with observables. The nice things of observables is they are telling you if something changed. And then you can bind this observable using the push pipe to your template. Perhaps you are saying now, hey, this is exactly what async is doing. Yes and not. It is about 90% what async is doing, but async demands zone.js. The async pipe does not work without zone.js because of the way it has been built. The push pipe will use directly mark dirty, so it will work without zone.js. And so we are on the safe side here. This is one proposal. Another proposal has been presented for the first time about three or four weeks ago at NG Connect at London by Mike Ryan, who is part of the NGRX team. And he is proposing a library called NGRX Component, which is about bringing reactivity to components. And what he is proposing is a base class for your Angular components, a base class called reactive component. And when you extend this base class, you get a connect method here. And connect gets key value pairs. The keys are names and the values are observables. Like this observable here that provides some data fetched using HTTP. And the nice thing about this connect method is it 
subscribes to all those observables and if an observable emits a new value, it puts this value into a property with this name and then it kicks mark uh, dirty. So that change detection kicks in. And that means at runtime we can just use traditional properties, the tra traditional variables like state.movies.length. You don't see much about async pipes and push pipes within the templates. I'm really excited about this proposal and I'm really looking forward to the future when this proposal lands in this or in that form. Saying this, I'm reaching the end of my presentation. If you liked it, I've written down a lot uh, about this stuff. If you want to have a more detailed look into the future of Angular, check out my blog articles, especially if you like this talk. And if you did not like this talk, please check out my articles anyway. Perhaps I'm writing better than I'm speaking. Who knows? So let me come to a conclusion. We have seen a lot of things. We have seen in short term, Angular Ivy provides for smaller bundles. In long term, there is huge potential for new features. For instance, for lazy components, for dynamic and higher order components, for optional NG modules, and for zoneless change detection. And just let me show you a last side of my favorite scientist, Emmett Brown, PhD, who said the future hasn't been written. I think it was one of the last sentences he spoke in the last movie. That means we don't know how these features will affect Ivy and Angular in the future, but what we know is Angular Ivy has been designed with all this in mind. That means sooner or later those features will come this or that way, hopefully. So thanks for coming. If you want to have all my examples and slides, you find it here. If you have some questions, you also find it here. You also find all the data about my workshops here. And if you want, uh, let's uh, keep in touch on Twitter so that we can follow each other. Thanks for coming and have a nice day.